Well, my first question really to you is something that I want to ask everyone in the in the series is, um, what brings you awe? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, actually, I came into the field, I guess, spontaneously in the beginning, because um, I'm a biologist and I study like aquatic ecology. And mm. uh, there is a lot of uh, topics, uh, there are a lot of topics that I find interesting about this field. And then uh, at some point I was, I finished my bachelor and my master's studies. And then I was looking for uh, opportunities to do a PhD in this direction. And mm. then I came, I learned about the group in Berlin, which uh, did uh, research on light pollution or artificial light at night, ecological effects of artificial light at night. And especially uh, this was a research group that worked on the Freshwater Ecology Institute. So they worked exactly in the waters, what is what I was looking for. And this was the actually first time that I even thought about this in the context that, right, if you look around, the light, night lights are everywhere, but I really never thought that this could have uh, some kind of ecological impact or of course, that it would be also influencing us. So hmm. that was kind of an eye opener for my for me at that point. And then um, I applied to the program I got in, and uh, since 2013, I've been working in this field. Hmm. Awesome! <laughs> wow! Cool! And and so, is there still there? <laughs> yeah, still there. Is there what, what drew you to biology? Is there a sense of wonder that you feel? Uh, in nature, it, or, I mean, that's, yeah. It is, it's really the appreciation of all these little and big processes. When you go out into the nature and you look around at the trees that are growing and the wind that's blowing and grass beneath your feet, and then you think how living nature is. And these mm. are all tiny little living beings that are living their lives and they have cells reproducing and uh, DNA replicating and some molecules going around sending signals and doing their work. And uh, I think this is really fascinating. And on every scale that you think of, whether it's molecular scale or bigger ecological scale on the levels of the like individuals moving around, forming populations and migrating and how things are connected to each mm. other in the web of life and in general in nature. So I think this is really a source of endless inspiration because there is so many things that we don't know and things are so complicated, but they seem to be going so smoothly because it's like a well-old machine that works in a certain way for mm -hmm. certain reasons because that's how it's been through the evolution um, efficiently and uh wow yeah that makes sense <laughs> i feel that too i feel that too especially if i go out into nature for like a week or or two it just like starts to hit me like day day one certainly but day two and three is even more it's yeah like, oh my gosh i am so not the center of this picture <laughs> at all <laughs> yeah and and yeah. you can just sit in a landscape and it all seems so calm and quiet, but there are so many things going on at the same time that uh, mm -hmm. it's really fascinating if you think about it. And you are just, mm -hmm. as you say, uh, one tiny piece of everything that is happening around you. Wow. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, so I guess the first sort of technical question that I have for you is how, and like, I should mention, I, I've certainly read a lot of research on this already, and mm -hmm. so I, I'm already informed a lot of these questions, but I like <laughs> want you to say them so that it's not just me blabbing the whole time. Um, mm -hmm. What, how, how does artificial light at night modif modify biodiversity, kind of? Like, how does it change um, biodiversity? Does it increase biodiversity? Does it decrease biodiversity in general? Um. Well, uh, that is a bit of a simplistic way to look at it. Okay. Um, I don't think we have exact answer to whether it decreases or uh, increases biodiversity because it's a very complicated question. And mm. there are a lot of organisms that may respond in different ways. So some groups can benefit from additional light at night. For example, mm. uh, spiders like to make their nets under the lights because this is where the insects aggregate at night and then they can uh, catch more prey 
grow more, reproduce more, and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, also bats, who then are, some of them, the bigger bats are attracted again to these areas where there is more prey around the light. So mm-hmm. they, you know, in this sense, light may influ- uh, like increase biodiversity of these groups, but biodiversity is again the, um, how many different species do we have? So it varies also very much between the species of the same group, how are they in particular responding to light? Because uh, some, for example, again with bats, uh, they are uh, one of the well-studied groups because they are nocturnal animals and one of the ones obviously who should be um, affected by lights at night. Uh, smaller bats, so smaller bat species seem to be avoiding the illuminated areas because they are also more visible to their predators. But the uh, larger ones are then benefiting from these insects that are attracted to the lights. And uh, this is the example where different species, just because of different size, uh, respond differently. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. But then I mean, there are, uh, yeah, great. I mean, there are so many uh, different types of organisms. Like if you think about fish, humans, birds, bats, plants, uh, they all respond in different ways. And um, we cannot really generalize across uh, mm. different living beings. I see. So it's not so much a overall increase or decrease, hard to say, but it's yeah, in no. general. It's, it's much it's more just, complex mm, than that. Right. That's good to know. <laughs> is there, um, what would you say is, what's one of the species that you've researched or interacted with that hits you, that you think of immediately when you think of a bad, like a really negative impact on this species or on this group? <laughs> Well, maybe something that uh, people have heard of are the sea turtles. Right. So the hatchlings of the sea turtles, which are uh, super cute and uh, everybody should think like, oh, nice. Uh, <laughs> charismatic turtle hatchlings, we should be sad if something happens to the little one that is now hatching from the egg and going towards the sea. But uh, we have a lot of research that shows that uh, if we have lighting across, um, well, behind the beach, beach or like close to the beach where uh, turtle hatchlings are uh, Mm. hatching, then they are disoriented by these lights often. And uh, instead of going towards the sea, uh, they go towards the roads and then they are uh, often killed by the cars or uh, they are stranded around looking Mm -hmm. uh, for ways to get to the sea. And then they are also spending more time on land exposed to the birds. They may eat them Mm. and so on. So this can be, I mean, many sea turtles are also endangered species or uh, threatened, and uh, this can be a big source of mortality for the hatchlings who are Mm. trying to reach the sea and then survive to the old age. Many, Mm. anyway, don't. Um, So now we have uh, policies, I think, in these areas that uh, lights are changed to the spectrum, which is less disrupting for the turtles. I think this would be like amber LED lights and red lights Mm-hmm. Uh, which mm-hmm. are then more ecologically friendly to say in gotcha. these areas. Right, that makes <laughs> a lot of sense. Cool. Yeah, the sea turtles are are oft sighted, and uh, it's a, a very yeah. cute example. But it's also like, yeah, <laughs> it's sad. I, and thing, uh, I mean, yeah. I I am an um, aquatic ecologist, so I don't really study charismatic um, organisms mm. in relation to light. I study periphyton, which is. Uh, slimy community of algae and bacteria that grows on the surfaces underwater. So mm. usually people don't like uh, to see this kind of, um, yeah, yeah, organisms. I will, I was going to ask you about periphyton. Is that mm-hmm. as periphyton gets impacted, what, what are some of the food chains that it's tied to? It is, um, you can think of it as plants because uh, it's the base of the food chain in the waters. So it's algae who are, again, uh, there is a big biodiversity in algae, but they are a good food food source for aquatic insects, for herbivorous fish, um, snails, um, basically, yeah, zooplankton as well, if uh, feeding on the phytoplankton dispersed in the water column and so on. So it is really the base of the food web. And then if you have some changes there, if maybe more or less grow under the illuminated uh, areas, in the illuminated areas, then 
this can mean more or less food uh, for the consumers later on in the food chain. And in this way, it may propagate through the ecosystem to influence the whole productivity. Also, um, it influences the biodiversity of the biofilm itself. So some algae may like more light and then grow more, or some may like it less and then grow less. So then you have a change community composition. And that means also that uh, the quality of the food could be changed for the consumers. So they may even eat like the same amount, but then they get less of omega-3 fatty acids which are crucial for their development or more and so on and this can then change again later the uh, basis in uh, the not the basis but it can change the balance in the ecosystem that exists before this uh, additional change or stressor like wow. artificial light at night I see, I see. So again, this is why it's so complicated. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is, this is the, my favorite thing about talking to experts. It's like, you're like, oh, yeah, this is the effect. And then you're like, oh, no, this is much more complicated than I thought. Yeah. But so and then when it, comes to, when it comes to light and to the perifiton, um, I was expecting when I started my PhD, I was looking at, um, we would go to pristine areas and install some lights and then see how the ecosystem that never experienced light at night before other than moonlight only uh, so no artificial light at night how would they respond to uh, this change and then we expected that light i mean normally plants do photosynthesis right algae do, do too so they absorb light and they make biomass uh, using this energy and then we expected because light at night is just additional illuminated period of the night compared to the daytime. So they will theoretically grow more. This is what you would expect. But then uh, it was a surprise to see that actually in my experiments, um, like all that I did, even in two different ecosystems, the algae in the end grew less under the illuminated conditions. And then it seems that this is some kind of a disturbance for them. So then you can think that actually having both daylight and night light or night time when there is no light is important for them because we have pretty much almost all the living beings that uh, have been studied have circadian rhythms which are based on the uh, movement of the planets and rotation of the earth so we have daytime during the day and night or no light during the night in the 24-hour period and we all have biological rhythms that are entrained to this 24-hour period mm. so there are certain processes that happen during the day and certain that happen during the night and darkness is maybe important in order to have them taking place the way they should um and it is undisturbed mm. they sleep in a way <laughs> yeah you know in their own way Possibly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they, I wonder if they dream. <laughs> no. um, <laughs> um, but yeah. Wow. Okay, cool. That thank you for sharing that. That's that's such a clear end to end story for me of like of seeing how the research uh basically showed that they, you know, grow less under artificial light. What kind of artificial light spectra did you test there? Was that LEDs? Was that sort of high pressure sodium? Uh, both actually we did one experiment with uh, white leds uh, so the typical ones that have a uh, blue peak also in their spectrum and uh, this blue peak has been uh, accused for many biological effects because blue light is quite important for again the circadian rhythms and um, also many insects are sensitive to the short wavelengths including the blue light so uh, a lot of effects that we can see are due to this uh, part of the particular part of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've also did experiments with the um, high pressure sodium lamps, uh, but uh, this was a field study and there were a lot of um, other factors also happening at the same time. But we basically, in the end, we only saw these changes under the white LEDs and not under the high pressure sodium lamps. Ah, okay. Cool. So high pressure sodium also doesn't have this uh, blue peak. They are more uh, narrowly spectrum in the yellow green part um, of the spectrum. And uh, this is, again, the reason why we think the spectrum plays a big role in mm -hmm. this effect. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, that's that's interesting to hear that the high pressure sodium didn't have an impact. The 
I mean, with the confounding variables, of course. Um, also, yeah. uh, internet's getting a little choppy here. Hopefully, it'll it'll stay alive. Um, mm-hmm. The my my initial thought there was just to mention too, like high pressure sodium just seems better in every way because uh, other than the fact that it sometimes makes people's eyes sort of like squint, <laughs> it's not great for <laughs> human vision or driving safety, but um, it's, it's sort of this trade off between driving safety or walking safety, human convenience, and then like all of these ecological factors. Um, uh, I was curious. Yeah. Do you- well, we- we can, we can use the LED that resembles the high pressure sodium, but then it uh, could uh, be more efficient, like the LEDs mm-hmm. normally are. Right, move the peak. And maybe have yeah less yeah. the less downsides. Mm, that makes sense. Cool. I was curious if there if are you aware of any studies that have looked directly at sky glow, uh, like not direct sunlight or I mean sorry mm-hmm. artificial light at night. But the sky glow that's induced, and then this is a again a very um, interesting field of study, and we there is so little that we know about this. And uh, I know, I mean, my colleagues are working on that, but uh, I none uh, published study on fish, and I've seen recently some studies published on. Um, was it in fish? It was certainly marine ecosystems, mm. like marine communities, maybe. Maybe zooplankton. But these are these are really scarce. This is uh, still an open question: how okay. much the sky glow is actually potentially having an effect because it's affecting much larger areas than the direct illumination. And mm-hmm. the brightness that we have in these areas is still ma- several magnitudes higher than what we have in natural conditions. Mm. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the, yeah, I mean, I feel like the, um, that's sort of one of the things that I'm trying to draw on without any direct research is like, mm-hmm. is, is drawing that connection between the sky glow and the impact. But I, I see what you mean. It, it's, so far, mostly known what the direct impact is. Um, it's yeah, I mean, this is a, this is very very uh, still very young field of study, um, mm. and it's only been since last ten years that the studies are increasing, and now they are almost exponentially increasing every year. Mm. So the, uh, um, mostly, what people are studying are uh, still uh, direct effects. Uh, I mean, uh, effects of direct illumination, but. Uh, uh, yeah, there are certainly also groups that are um, studying questions related to sky glow. It's just that it takes time until right. we um, know what they are, what is all happening, and what what is being done in the world. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Is so uh, one thing that I sort of anticipate with this series is like people, particularly people who maybe don't go out into nature that much. <laughs> um, mm-hmm being really skeptical and being and skeptical is fine. I'm, I'm in a lot of ways talking to the skeptics because I want, want to convince them and also keep them skeptical. Um, Mm -hmm. but people who, who might be like, why should I care? Like (laughs) why, like there's all these impacts and they seem multifaceted and maybe not fully understood, certainly, but why should, should we care and what should be done? Should we do anything about this? Or should we just keep going with the LED streetlight adoption? <laughs> what would you say to that? Um, why should we care is uh, always uh, a tricky one. <laughs> mm. I mean, um, even for people who don't leave the cities to go, go out to the nature, they do enjoy going into a park or being next to a river or a lake. And then it's a nicer experience if first there is no treasure lying around. And uh, secondly, if these ecosystems look healthy and if like algae are not blooming in this lake where you went because maybe there is too much nutrients or uh, it's polluted or it's too warm and uh, all these other factors if there is no urban pollution coming into the lake or 
Um, Mm. There is, uh, I mean, there is some aesthetic value in these ecosystems that are healthy or in balance, so to say. And this is why we also try to minimize the pollution, um, like chemical pollution when we talk about the cities. And uh, while we also try to have them looking natural and kind of nice and neat. Um, mm. I think there are always city services that try to do some work around to maintain them, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, like light is also some kind of a stressor that influences that environment and then it changes it in a way. And especially in cities, we have so many other factors that are already um, influencing the whole urban areas. And then this is one additional one that just introduces more pressure and puts it more out of the balance. And we don't know yet in uh, which ways and how it interacts with other things, but um, it's always better to minimize these pressures if we can. And when it comes to artificial light at night, it's really easy to um, remove this stressor from the surroundings. It's, I mean, for the pollution that has been there for a long time, this will also take a long time to restore some area. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to lights, it's uh, switching them on or off. And um, this is already having, a, having an immediate effect. Right. And then it's also about using it right. So we are never advocating for the world without lights because, of course, we have so many benefits from the artificial light at night. And it allows us to do so many things and to uh, prolong our activities into the mm -hmm. night. And this is important. But we can also use it in a smarter way that we use it when we need it, for example. It would already be a big improvement to switch it off when you are not there to see the light. There is no reason for your garden, if you have a garden at home, to be illuminated the whole night if you're not there to see it. So then switch it off and uh, you know, go to bed and let also the night animals have their own party in the, in the darkness. Absolutely. And then we can... <laughs> We can also think uh, to use this uh, spectra that is less disturbing. So no um, cool white LEDs and mm -hmm. uh, the light intensity is also something that we can um, adjust because with LEDs, people tend to buy more than what they actually need because they are so cheap. Or when you replace all the lights, you get more efficient, more bright light. And then you end up in the end again using much more than what you had before. So just adjusting these light levels to what you actually need and not what you can get for the same amount of money is um, one step in the right direction. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. I completely... Will already um, be an improvement. Oh, sorry, say that again? I'm saying there are a lot of small changes that we can do that will already show an improvement um, or a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wow. Cool. Thank you for that perspective. <laughs> uh, that that really, yeah. I'm excited to edit that and 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 see how it fits. It, that feels like it really satisfyingly answers the question for me at least. <laughs> of, you know, why should I care? Is there so one of the things that I talk about is um, you're talking about pressure and evolutionary pressure, and uh, one of the things that I try and point out is that there's a risk here of entire ecosystems or like entire branches of life um, potentially collapsing, at least the way that they've existed so far. Is that reasonable? And is there something, something else that's maybe even more important than thinking about the food chains that affect us? I don't know if that makes sense. Um, well, uh uh, this ecosystem is collapsing. It's a bit of a um, bit a catastrophic uh, uh, scenario. And um, if that something like that is, be a lot of factors that play a role, and uh, not only one happens for a certain with a certain event, like a nuclear catastrophe or something like that. 
but uh, we see now more and more studies that are reporting how insects are declining at many locations um, throughout the world. And uh, light has also been shown as one of the important factors that negatively influences insects. So we know that uh, at least when it comes to moths, for example, uh, one nocturnal, nocturnal group, um, those that are attracted to light are declining more than those that are not. Uh, so this is kind of one uh, evidence that we have that shows that these changes in light can also have uh, really strong influences on the population level, not only for the small areas or for the individual species, but um, really on the higher levels in the ecosystem. Mm. And um, sorry, what was the second question again? Aha, uh, yeah, what should we also worry about? Um, well, the light at night also influences us directly. So it's not only about the turtles and algae and um, all the other organisms out there that we sometimes feel we have no connection to, but it's also that we ourselves have uh, biological rhythms and we have photoreceptors that um, detect light. And we are also influenced by all these electrical devices that we use at night. And now we watch, you know, smartphones and computers and movies, everything um, throughout the night until we go to sleep. And this also has an influence on our uh, hormonal rhythms and the uh, production of the melatonin hormone, which is in charge of many things that are happening in our body, including the regulation of these uh, circadian clocks and our immunity, um, the ways our cells um, protect from disease and um, uh, divide and renew mm -hmm. themselves. And uh, it's important for our sleep patterns, for our general health. So um, this could also have, as I said, direct impacts on us, not only on uh, nature mm -hmm. out there. I see what you mean. So, it, yeah, I see what you mean. So the we are nature, I guess. is the, <laughs> yeah. We are, we are definitely, this goes back to the uh, beginning of our story. This reminds us that we are nature because we have all these sophisticated mechanisms as other living beings do. Uh, we are no different from them in that regard. And uh, mm. yeah, yeah, we are influencing ourselves as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's actually <laughs> sort of a whole segment of this video dedicated to sleep science so and mm -hmm. and the crazy things that happen when you when you do you know watch um <laughs> or like use screens before bed um mm -hmm. gosh so i'll say i i've actually gone through most of my like written down questions and now i'm just sort <laughs> of chasing little threads of curiosity um mm -hmm. i wonder well, one question is what's on the horizon for for you and it's does that include light pollution research still and um what what are you thinking about next? Um yeah, definitely. I am thinking about many questions related to the light pollution research and uh, in general artificial light at night mm -hmm. and uh, predominantly waters because this is where my heart lies. There are uh, um, enough open questions that we will not uh, run out of them uh, anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So sense. I'm definitely uh, um, yeah, uh, trying to continue my research and uh, secure funding for uh, next years to do so. <laughs> right. I hear you. What would be, uh, what, what's one of the, well, here's a question. What's, what's one of the ecosystems or, or groups of, um, life that you've come across in nature that is affected by artificial light? I mean, I guess algae is pretty clear, but um, I'm just actually, it's funny. I'm looking at this picture right on my other screen of Lake Toville of the green uh -huh. water. <laughs> and I just, <laughs> I think I just answered my own question, but <laughs> any thoughts there? Of what other ecosystems are uh, sensitive yeah, or, uh, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Exactly. I think uh, um, there is also some uh, fascinating research happening with the coral reefs. Um, and uh, 
coral reefs uh, have a specific time of spawning in the year, which is synchronized with the moon cycle. And um, the research has shown that this desynchronizes if they are exposed to um, the artificial light. Mm. And I am not sure which light levels are we talking about here, but uh, that could be in the range of uh, sky glow that we talked about. And uh, the corals are also uh, symbionts of animals and algae. So this connection also gets influenced by the exposure to artificial light at night. And um, the algae seem to be stressed by this additional light and then influences the whole coral health and uh, their physiology. So I think this is also one uh, fascinating thing that um, not many people are aware of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's funny. I've, in my previous video, I made a video about the moon, and I was I talked about that specific mm -hmm. thing of the coral spawning. It's synced with the lunar cycles, yeah. and I didn't connect the two. <laughs> but one of my <laughs> friends works in the in the reefs, so I'm gonna I'm gonna Skype him and or Zoom him. And, and there is a research group in Israel who is looking at that. If you want to Google later on to see, mm, okay, potentially, yeah, <laughs> awesome. Wow. Okay. Um, is there? I mean, well, I guess this isn't really a fair question. I was going to say, are there any like large animals that you know of that, that, uh, but I mean, your focus is on aquatic, uh, life and particularly prairie fighting. So I don't know, but is, are there like large fish? There maybe? is some research on, go for uh, <laughs> well, there is some research on, uh, mammals, which I guess would be, uh, the biggest, um, <laughs> animal I know of that was studied in the uh, or uh, swans are also kind of pretty big birds. <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> so um, mm -hmm. I know of a uh, researcher who studied um, sleep in birds and in urban birds and swans, pigeons, uh, some other birds as well. And um, um, yeah, also like Australian mammal species. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Like, yeah, I think I found some stuff on kangaroos, which was fun. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, or wombats or something like that. <laughs> mm, yeah, wombats too. <clears throat> let, me, let me just check my list of questions again. And, and uh -huh. maybe if you, if you were doing this interview, what would you ask you? <laughs> <laughs> Any ideas? Well, I mean, we can, you can always uh, ask me later on if you come up with something uh, that you, okay. you know, you really uh, like, how did I forget this? Okay, cool. I'll let, I'll let you know. I guess one, yeah. la one last thing um, is I, I want to make sure I know how to say your name because at mm -hmm, some point so I might do it's So it's Maya Grubicic? Grubicic. Grubicic. Ah, one more time. Grubicic. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> Grubicic. Is that right? Ish. Okay, cool. Yeah. I studied German for a while, but uh, I still I was uh, looking this at your Serbian. Last... I, oh, I come Serbian. from Serbia. Oh, Serbian. Mm. Ah, okay, okay, okay. That answers some questions. Cool. Uh, yes, also, uh, but that answers an uh, unspoken uh, question about my accent, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Awesome. <laughs> wow, cool. Well, thank you so much for taking taking 45 minutes and, and uh, talking to me. This is so helpful. I'll I'll let you know if I, um, you know, have any other questions. And um, you wanted me to um, just say a sentence about me. Um, yeah, absolutely. In case you will use it, so I can, you know, do that now. We haven't uh, done it before. Yes, please. <laughs> so uh, my name is Maya Grubišić, and I'm a biologist. I've been uh, studying artificial light at night since 2013 when I started my PhD on this topic in Berlin. And um, my research focuses on ecological effects on night lights on rivers, in particular algae, but also invertebrates and vertebrate biorhythms. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> I really appreciate your time. This is so cool. It's You're definitely worth, worth getting up early. <laughs> it's nice that uh, you are uh, making this. So I'm looking forward to it.